I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is I don't intend to keep you for long. Famous last words. The bad news is I forgot my notes. <laughs> so uh, anything can happen in the next half hour. Um, I'm trying to find somewhere to clip this actually. But uh, let me see if I'll just clip it on there. No. Oh, there we go. That's it. Right. I don't know about you, but I, I don't never make New Year's resolutions. Because by January the 2nd, I've broken most of them. But what I do do is I look at what I do and look at why I do what I do. If you know what I mean. Why am I doing what I'm doing, whether that's in my personal life, in church life, or whatever. Why do I do what I do? Is there any purpose in what I do? Is it bearing fruit, what I do? Because that's the important thing, isn't it? Whether what we do in God bears fruit. Or is it a case of the horse has been dead for 20 years, it's time to get off. And I was looking at the start of this year and thinking about us as a church because I believe 2024 is a very, very important year for this church. I want to tell you the things of the Spirit are going to increase this year. The gifts of the Spirit are going to increase this year. There is promises that God has made to this church that he still wants to deliver and he wants us to see. But the thing is, we need everybody on board, everybody involved and everybody committed 100% to see it come to pass. The problem in the church, and these are not my statistics, these are actually the statistics, that 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. And I was looking, and the Lord reminded me of a, a word he gave me years and years and years ago, and then Ellen reminded me as well. And sometimes listen to my wife and listen to the Holy Spirit, he's pretty much the same thing. So I want to share that with you this morning, if that's okay. But if it ain't, I'm still going to share it. But can you pass my drink, Adam, please, from down here? But I remember a long, long time ago, I was out of work a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. It's not that. But a long time ago, I remember being out of work. And I was out of work for quite some time. And I was a bit down in the dumps and a bit fed up and a bit browned off because when a bloke don't go to work, what does he do? And I was a bit down and Ellen knew it. And I said to Ellen the one day, I'm going to go down by the train station because I live just around the corner from Langley Green St train station. So I said, I'm going to go down to the train station. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do down the train station? I don't know what she thought I was going to do, but I got no money, so I couldn't go anywhere. But I said, I just feel I need to go and sit on the train because I love trains. I love trains. And I sat there, it was a beautiful sunny day, I remember it, like yesterday, it was a beautiful sunny day. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just watching trains come in to Birmingham, trains to Kidderminster going the other way. I watch people getting on and off the train. Some get on at Langley, some, get, some trains go straight through and don't stop. And I'm sitting there watching, the Lord begins to speak to me. And he said, just observe, just observe, just look at what you see. And he put one word on my heart and one word on my mind. And that word was this, passengers. Passengers. And he reminded me of a song that I used to show, I'm showing my age now, showing 
a song that I used to sing in Sunday school as a kid. I don't know if anybody remembers it. It used to go a bit like this. Join the Gospel Express, come along and say yes. We're leaving for glory soon. Yeah. Don't know why that dropped into my head, but it did. And the Lord said, just I just want you to observe. Well, looking at trains, I'm not a train spotter, but I don't mind trains. I love trains. And I was watching some people get on, some people get off, some people not getting off at all. Some people asleep. And I felt the Lord say to me, I'm not looking for passengers in the body of Christ. Now there's a sense in which we're all passengers because he's the one driving the train. We are not driving the train. He's the one driving the train. So in that sense, we are all on passengers. We've got a destination. We're going to the destination. The train driver knows where the destination is. But So in that sense, we're all passengers. But in another sense, we're not passengers. And these are the kind of passengers the Lord revealed to me. The first one, there are people that get on a train where the train starts. And they stay on the train till it reaches its destination. Then there's nowhere else to go. Then there are other passengers who get on a train. They might get on at the start, but wherever it is, they get on the train. And then they get off at different stops along the way. And then the third one, this is the one that really made me sit up. Wow, what, what, what do you mean, Lord? The third one was fair dodgers. That made me sit up, I'm telling you. I said, Lord, what do you mean, fair dodgers? Well, I want to deal with the fair dodgers first. Before I'm working where I work now, same company, different branch, I used to work at the Toysley branch in Birmingham. And it used to take me an hour and a half to travel back on the train, uh, on the car, sorry. I was at work in Birmingham, know what Birmingham's like. The Hagley Road was writ off most days. Took me ages to get home. I could leave at 10 to 4, not get back in my house till 20 to 6. It's only eight miles. So I decided I'm going to go on the train. Langley Green Station, direct train straight through to Toysley Station, Job done, jobs are good. Except when they get cancelled. But I did that. But this is the strange thing. And the Lord reminded me of this. Every single morning, without fail, there was a guy who used to get on the train. And you know they've got the toilets on the train where the door comes around like that. He'd lock himself in the toilet as soon as he got on the train. And the funny thing was, as soon as we got into Toysley Station, we are now approaching Toysley Station, and the train was drawing to a halt. Ooh, the doors would open and out he'd come. Now, either he had a dodgy curry every single night, <laughs> either he was as regular as clockwork, or he didn't want to pay the cost of the journey. You see, fair dodgers in the body of Christ are people who want to come along on the journey, come along on the ride, enjoy the ride, enjoy the glory, enjoy the blessing, and don't want to contribute anything to the cost of the journey. Don't want to pay the cost of the journey. And right at the start of this year, if we are going to see all the things that God has promised, I am telling you that we need to step up to the plate and be fully committed to what God is doing. Because let me tell you, stop praying for revival if you're not prepared to step up and pay the cost of revival. Because it'll cost you your time. It'll cost you your night off. It'll cost you your weekends resting. It'll cost you financially. Now, not everybody can give financially. I accept that. But God wants more than Sundays and Tuesday nights. Or Wednesday nights or Thursday nights, whatever. 
And the kind of passenger, that's not the kind of passenger the Lord is looking for. Something else. Bear in mind what I said, 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. Who pays the cost for the people that are fair dodging? The other passengers. I wrote this down because I googled it yesterday. I googled it this morning because I forgot my notes. They reckon that the train companies lose £240 million a year through fare avoidance. You see, what happened with this guy who locked himself in the toilet was I suffered because of him. Let me tell you, when you get up early in the morning, you have two cups of tea, and you wait on the cold station for 30 minutes for a train, Toysley's not a million miles away. Let me tell you. It's like, Lord, please let us get there quickly. Lord, please let me hold it. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm being honest with you. You see, the thing is, I was suffering because I needed to go where he was, but he was on no intention of paying the cost of the fare. He wanted to get away without paying, and the person who suffered was me. You know, it's like that in the body of Christ. Because if people don't commit to what God is doing, it falls on all the people that are already committed. And who pays the price? The people that ends up getting burnt out at the end of it. How many church leaders have left because they've been burnt out? They've been frustrated. They've been put upon, dumped upon, and left to do it all. But people who say we're with you but never turn up. I'm sorry if this seems harsh. I'm just being honest. Because this is how the Lord speaks to me. And believe me, I've had to go through this first. See, I was in a church where I did most of the preaching. I was on the pastoral team. I was in the worship group. I was helping with the youth team, the youth group. I was doing the men's work. Didn't have a night at home. And the Lord said, I want you to put that down. Why? Because it had become a chore. Because I was doing it because nobody else would do it. And my heart and soul weren't in it. See, it's not about the ministry for me. It's about doing what God wants me to do. It's not about a ministry or pat on the back or people saying, that was brilliant. I, I, I don't want that. And I left it all and I walked away from, the, from that church. And I fell out of love with the church. And then I remember we were away on holiday, and Ellen says, I want you to come to this church with me. And I didn't want to go, but I obeyed the wife, and I went, and I last. And in the meeting, <laughs> and in the meeting, the Holy Spirit spoke to me personally, specifically, like he hadn't done for a few years. Actually, that's not true. The probably truth is I wasn't listening. But you know what? It was also at a time where our marriage was going through a dodgy spell. At the same time. But you know what happened? The Lord spoke to me. The Lord changed my attitude. The Lord changed my heart. And I fell back in love with my wife. Not that I ever stopped loving her, but you can love somebody but not be in love with them. Do you know what I'm saying? But then I also fell in love with Jesus again. And you know what? When I fell in love with Jesus again, I fell in love with the church again. Let me tell you, if you love Jesus, you will love his church. If you are committed to Jesus, you will be committed to his church. If you love Jesus, you will love every other member of the body of Christ. If you are committed to Jesus, you will be committed to every brother and sister sitting right next to you along the road. So we cannot get by on giving the bare minimum to God. It is time for the body of Christ to stand up and be the body of Christ. That's the first kind of passenger. The second one were those that get on the train. 
And they get off at different stops at different des destinations. Now, isn't that what Je Jesus said would happen here? People would come in for a season. They would take it away with them somewhere else. That will happen too. Let me tell you, there are people, and I'm not talking about here, but there are people in the body of Christ that have left that I've been devastated when they've left. There are other people I keep praying, Lord, will you move them on? Like, but, you know what I mean? But, but, but I'm being honest. I'm being honest. See, the people that leave ain't usually the people you want to. But, so that's right. But also, there are people that come to a church for a certain time and the minute the pastor says something they don't like, the leadership do something they don't agree with, well, I'm getting off here. This is my stop. Not looking for them kind of passengers either. And then there are the passengers that stay on till it reaches destination. Now, I noticed something about them. See, you could stay on the train, but some of them were sleeping on the train. Now, you could sleep on the train, but you'll still get to your destination because the train driver is committed to take you to the destination that he's going to. But you could sleep all the way there, you'll still get there. But the thing is, I've noticed, if you fall asleep on a journey, you miss so much. You miss so much. Do you know, I'll go from Netherton every single day of the week on, up to work, I'll go down... Baptist End Road, up Church Road, past the Reservoir, turn right by Mary Hill, up the road, and I work there. And I've been working there for four years. Six months ago, I noticed there was a post office <laughs> in Netherton. <laughs> been driving through it for four years. You see, sometimes you can be that, you can be that comfortable your destination ultimately is heaven. That's great. We're on the way to heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank God for that, by the way. But you can be so asleep on the journey that you miss what God wants to do on the way. You miss a lot of things. We sing it, don't we? Even when I don't see it, you're moving. Sometimes it's because we're asleep. But God wants to do things along the way and show us things and teach us things along the way. And we need to be awake and we need to be alert so we don't miss what God is doing. Because you can still get to where you're going, but sleep all the way. How many times have you come back from somewhere and you thought, oh, I never noticed that before. So he wants a church that is so in love with him that whatever he demands of us is not too much trouble for us. You see, I made the mistake of thinking, I said, Lord, look, I'm out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. No, sorry, I'm out Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Blah, 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 blah. You know, Wednesday night, it's my night. No, it ain't. It's his night. Like every other night of the week is his night. How dare I think it's my night? See, I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. He owns me. Nobody owns me. Excuse me, if you're in Jesus Christ, he owns you. He has the right to put any demand on you that he sees fit. Oh, the Lord will never ask me for everything. There's a Greek word for that. <laughs> in fact... All that the Lord demands of each one of us is all of us. That's the minimum. I was reading something the other day and a verse jumped out to me that I've read so many times from a story I've read so many times. I don't know what your definition of worship is, but it's probably different to his. How do I know that? Because my definition of worship was different to his too. See, we could come to church on a Sunday and we can, we've, we've 
brought worship down almost to the level of singing. We brought worship down to the level of singing. Oh, it's singing. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with it. And the worship was brilliant this morning. Don't get me wrong. Don't even see what I'm saying. But it's like worship is, oh, I'll come in and I'll sing a few songs to Jesus on a Sunday morning. And that sets me up for the... Wor- you see, you can come to church... Sing songs to Jesus on a a Sunday. Raise your hands, speak in tongues, shout louder than anybody else, sing louder than anybody else, dance around, run around, jump up and down, speak in tongues, whatever you want to do, and then do what you want to do for the rest of the week. So don't tell me you're worshipping God. Because worship is not an act or an activity. It is a lifestyle. Chris Bowater taught me that years ago. He never left me. I've forgotten it sometimes, and the Lord has to remind me. But worship is a lifestyle. Do you want to know what God's definition of worship is? Do you want to know? Do you know what the Lord of first mention is in the Bible? The Lord of first mention is the first time something's mentioned in the Bible. Is there a reason for that? Because he wants to give you clear, clarity and clearness and make it absolutely crystal clear to you. Emphasize the word so you understand the context and what the word actually means. Does anybody know where the first time worship is mentioned in the Bible? Genesis. Good guess. That's right. It's actually in Genesis 22 verse 5. That's the first time worship is mentioned in the Bible. And I'm going to show you in context what God's idea of worship is. Genesis 22 verse 5, that's what it is. You see, we can come and sing songs on a Sunday. Singing doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't require much of us. It doesn't cost us. David said, I'll give the Lord nothing that doesn't cost me anything. If it don't cost me, I ain't going to give it to the Lord. If it ain't going to cost me, it ain't worth giving. That's why the Bible, see, the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. I'm going to show you what God's definition of worship is. Genesis 22, verse 5. From background, the story is Abraham being told to sacrifice his child, his son, Isaac. The son of promise, the promised one that God said, this is the one your seed through all the nations will be blessed. This is your son that I promised you and your wife. This is the one, this is the one you've been waiting for all these years, Abraham. And what was Abraham going to do? It says the next morning he got up and he left and he travelled to Moriah where the Lord had told him to go. And it's interesting in Genesis 22 verse 5 it says this, Abraham had taken people with him. And Abraham says to the people, he says, me and the lad will go on ahead and we will worship. The first recorded worship meeting in the Bible. There's no guitar, no keyboard, no stage, no smoke machines, no lights, no words on a screen, no choir, no microphone, nothing. There's just a hundred year old man and his son. The first recorded worship meeting in the Bible. What was Abraham going to do? What did Abraham go there to do? Sacrifice his son. He says, I'm going to worship. He's going to sacrifice his son. Why? Because God told him. Interesting. You see, worship is not an activity. Worship is not an act you go through. It's not something you do. And we've equated in church that we're going to worship the Lord for 25 minutes before the sermon. What are you doing the rest of the week? See, God's definition of worship is this. You give me what I require of you just simply because I ask. Whatever I demand of you, you give to me whether it costs you or not. See, a lifestyle of worship is not singing songs to God. Nothing wrong with that. I love singing and praising God. 
but a lifestyle of worship where our worship comes out of, where if we want to truly worship God in spirit and truth, it has to come from a lifestyle that says, look God, whatever you require of me, I'm going to give without questioning whether it costs me or not, whether there's anything in it for or not, whether I agree with you or not, I'm going to give you what you ask because that's what you require of me. And we sing all to Jesus, I surrender, but you can't have my time. You can't have my money. You can't have Wednesday night because that's my night, Lord. I can't give up my Saturdays because I work all week. He don't care. You see, sometimes we have to push through our tiredness. Trust me, I know. I work in a place, I work with two lads. And I'm not being funny, I'm not blowing my own trouble. They don't work as hard as me. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But if they've got any way to get out of work, they'll do it. I'm different, I think. I don't always get it right, but I like to work from the point of view that Jesus is my boss. Which means I won't take five minutes here, extra break here, or, you know, or, or whatever. But it's frustrating. Because Helen knows I could be doing the garden all day and I can work hard in the garden all day and get the garden straight and I'm tired at the end of the day but it's a fulfilled tiredness because it's achieved something. When we work together as a team at work I still feel tired because it's quite physical sometimes but I go home and I'm the oldest there. But I go home and I feel fulfilled when they've helped. But when it's all come on me I get so frustrated. You're tired but it's a frustrated tiredness. That's why we need each other. We talk about the body of Christ working together, working together, working together. So I have to manually lift. Now, what do you lift with? Like that. See, if I just lift with my hands like that, I guarantee you, eventually, I'm going to put me back out. That's correct. That's correct. Although I'm, I'm actually carrying the weight in my hands, it's actually the legs that do the, the lifting. That way I don't damage my back. That way I don't damage my knees or my elbows or my hands. I'm not putting all the strain on my wrists. But my legs are helping me lift. You know, it's like that in the body of Christ. There are so many people in the body of Christ with bad backs, spiritually. Because the legs have been up on the sofa while the hands have been doing all the work. And I have to say, if it's a challenge this year, because it's challenged me, the challenge this year that the Lord wants to put down in front of us as a church is, what are you prepared to lay down? What are you prepared to give to me? If I require every night of the week, are you prepared to give it? Worship. is about obedience. That's worship as God sees it. What are you going to give to me? If I want everything, would you give me everything? Maybe the widow's might. Maybe your last meal. Don't ask me that one, Lord, please. But you know what I mean. Maybe your last meal. Because whatever you give to the Lord, he always gives back to you, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Far, you want to see the blessings of God? I want to tell you what to do. Give him your time. Give him everything that you have. Don't just give him a little slot in your busy week. But if he is the Lord of every single day and you give him every single day, I'll tell you, the blessings will follow. But what kind of passenger are you? What kind of passenger are you this morning? See, the thing is, when you're on a train, we've had it this morning already, you will go through dark places because you go through tunnels. I remember we're going to Birmingham. I think it's New Street Station. There's a long tunnel before you go into New Street Station. And it's very dark. And my sister hated the dark. And me being the loving big brother that I am, I used to laugh because <laughs> she used to get scared. But the thing is, we will go through dark spells where we can't see the wood from the trees, as they say. 
where we can't see what's going on. We can't see what's going on around us, but rest assured, the train driver knows exactly where he's going, even in the, tra- even in the dark times, even when you're in the midst of the trouble. We can't see what's going on, but he knows what the destination is, and he'll get you through it if you keep walking in the midst of the darkness. The trouble is, it said, the Bible says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the key is you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but what we do is we get, we get a little bit of dark place, we pitch our tent, we tent, we start smelling the roses, we start adapting their philosophies, we start listening to what they say, and we let that dictate to us instead of knowing that the train driver knows exactly where he's going, even when it's dark. And it says in Psalm 23, your rod and staff comfort me. You know what that means? So you can't stand still in Jesus, even in the dark places. That's why it says, even though I walk through the valley, the rod and staff comfort me. The rod is the Lord giving you a little poke to say, I know it's dark, I know it's trouble, I know, it, I know it's, there's a lot of trouble around you, but still keep on walking. Just a little step, just a little step, just a little step, just a little step. So my question, my prayer has been for a long time, Lord, let the spirit of true worship rise up in the flame. But God's definition of worship is as it was with Abraham in its purest sense. If I ask you for everything you've got, will you give it me? What will you withhold from me? See, to obey is better than sacrifice. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said to his disciples, go into the world and make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we don't have a problem with that, do we? But then he goes on, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Parents, you want to know how to teach your children to obey all that he's commanded you? Obey all that he's commanded you. You understand? The way to teach your children to obey all that he's commanded you, which is a command of Jesus, is to obey yourself all that he's commanded you. Grandparents, not me, exactly the same. How do you teach your grandchildren to obey all that the Lord has commanded? By obeying all that the Lord has commanded. Really is that simple. We're going to see. It's going to be a great year this year, I'll tell you. I feel it in my bones. You know? But you see, we can come and we can sing worship songs on a Sunday. We can sing louder than anybody else. We can shout louder than anybody else. We can raise our hands higher than anybody else. We can speak in tongues more than anybody else and then go and live how we want for the rest of the week. Don't tell me you worship God. You sing songs to God. I can go up there, Albion, and sing songs to Albion. I can go over the pub and sing Niggies Up Mother Brown. If that's what we've reduced worship to, then we have no idea what it is. Worship is a lifestyle. See, Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. The Holy Spirit only comes to glorify Jesus. So I want to repeat, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with singing, raising your hands, shouting, singing loudly, singing quietly, just speaking. There's nothing wrong with any of that. You see, if you have a lifestyle of worship, even in the tough times you worship, How many Christians I've heard say, I've had a bad week this week, I'm I'm not going to worship the Lord, I'm not going to come to church because I've had a bad week. Well, 
It's time to get out the cot. And I make no apologies for saying that. It's time to get out the cot. Because God's looking for a people that are so in love with him, so committed to him, that nothing is too much for him to demand of us. I don't know where you are this morning. I'm going to close now. But I just want to throw out the challenge that the Lord challenged me. How much are you prepared to lay down for me? How much are you prepared to let me have? How much are you prepared to let me use you in? Because it's a serious question. It's a serious question. And maybe you're here this morning. And you're saying, yes, Lord, I'm a fair dodger a little bit. So I don't know, it's nothing to do with me. And I'm sorry, Lord, I've shut myself in that toilet so I don't have to pay the cost of the fare. I've shut myself away. But if we want to see revival, and I believe it's going to come in this place, then we've got to be prepared to pay the cost. If you're not prepared to pay the cost, stop praying for it. Because it's going to require our time our efforts, our money. It's going to require more than we give. Maybe past disappointments still hold you captive and cripple you and stop you. Maybe words that have been spoken over you have paralyzed you. But hey, You'll get to where you're going if you let the train driver drive. And maybe you need to lay them down. Joy said the other week about it's time to lay down all the obstacles. And it really is time. Stop using them like a little comfort blanket. Throw off every weight, the Bible says. You Throw it off. Because I'm telling you, what God is going to do, oh, hallelujah, it's going to require all of us pulling in the right direction, the same direction at the same time, working towards the same goal. And it'll be inconvenient. You see, God... I used to say, well, I'll have Wednesday off because I've been tired. The Lord understands. You know, that's rubbish. The Lord does not understand disobedience. Because Jesus did everything the Father told him to do. And the Holy Spirit does everything God the Father, God the Son tell him to do. A lifestyle of obedience is a lifestyle of worship to God. Have I got this right all the time? You bet I ain't. But it challenged me. This is what you've reduced worship to, son. Let me show you what it is. That's powerful. That is powerful. See, he's not looking for worship. He says, if you don't praise me, the stones and the rocks will cry out to praise me. He's looking for worshippers. What are worshippers? Worshippers are people who lay it all on the line for him. That's a lifestyle of worship. It says, Lord, even if I don't agree with you, I'm going to do what you say. Even if I'm going to get nothing out of it, Lord, I'm going to do what you say. Even if I don't understand it, I'm going to do what you say. We sang about it this morning, what he's done. 
what he's done. See, he doesn't own part of us. Not like a car that has joint ownership between us and him. He owns all of us. And you know what? He requires all of us. And he demands all of us. Everything we have. Everything we are. And I don't know where you are in God this morning. But I just wanted to throw that challenge out this morning. We're all passengers on the same train. But what kind of passenger are you? Amen.